Hey team, welcome back to another Data Science 1 lecture. Uh, today we're going to be continuing where we left off last time, starting to talk about some more nonlinear models um, and, and build up our web repertoire of ways that we model our data science projects. Um, and we're going to uh, start that by continuing our discussion on, on trees and then move into another model, uh, SVMs. Uh, so we uh, ended last time uh, saying um, that the decision, decision trees were a great tool to use, but they by themselves had some flaws, uh, particularly, that, particularly that they couldn't fit the data very well, uh, especially in, in generalization time. Um, so we built uh, ensembles of trees, random forests, that, uh, that did a much better job of that. Now there's one other uh, way that we can build ensembles, um, especially of decision trees, um, and we'll we'll start with that today. Um, so, so this method uh, is based uh, around the idea of residuals. Uh, so uh, unlike last time when I talked more about framing things in terms of classification um, for the, uh, the ensemble methods in random forests, uh, and on today's ensemble, we're going to frame uh, the, the ideas more towards uh, regression problems, uh, and then at the end, uh, note that, that they do apply to both, just like, uh, just like last time. Uh, when we frame for classification, the, the resulting uh, ensemble approach uh, applied to, to both classification and regression. So with the regression, uh, one of the things that, uh, that you may remember uh, from either early in the semester or, or more likely from your basic statistics classes is the idea uh, of fitting curves with, uh, with linear regression um, and, and especially trying to, trying to think about how well these curves are fit. We have lots of metrics like uh, our R-squared values, our, is our correlation coefficient. Um, if we're looking at a loss function like mean squared error, we can measure that as well. Uh, but, but one of the, the best ways to visually uh, double check that, that you fit a, a good line uh, is with a regression or with a residual plot. And that's going to be one of the, the core ideas that, that we focus on in the first half of the lecture today is, is the ideas of residuals. Uh, so this is something we've, we've discussed a little bit earlier in the semester as well, uh, thinking about what types of errors you get um, when, when you're fitting a model. And, and with uh, residual plots, what you're, you're plotting uh, is just the, the error after the fit. Um, so think about uh, the, the curve, or in this case, the, the straight line uh, on the, the left panel here. Um, and, and imagine you know, the errors, positive and negative, uh, with your data points to that trend line. Um, and, and that's exactly what we're plotting on the right here, is just those differences. So think about taking that, uh, that uh, trend line and just flattening it out. Um, when, uh, when we have a, a nonlinear curve, we also have to, to bend the, the curve to, to make it flat, to, to create this x-axis here. Um, but, but either way, think about, uh, think about these residuals as being what's left over when you take away the trend that you've modeled from your data. Now, hopefully, your residuals look something like this and that they're scattered above and below the, the x-axis and they look pretty random. Um, that's a, a good sign that you fit your data well, that there's not obvious patterns left over after you take away that trend line. You mostly have white noise or, or Gaussian noise. Um, if you fit a model that, that doesn't well represent the trends in your data, what you'll see is, is structure in your residual plot like this, uh, where, where it appears as though someone used a, a lower order model than, than they should have to fit this trend. So for example, this could be a, a, a trend line that should have been quadratic, but was fit with a, a linear model, for example. Um, and and that, would, uh, that would suggest, uh, and specifically this, this pattern here would suggest um, that, that you need to go back and, and fit uh, a, a more complex model to this data. Um, and that's the way that, that uh, you've mostly heard of residual plots used uh, in, in your basic statistics is just a, a manual check on whether or not the model that you chose was the right one. And if your residual plot doesn't look good like this one does, what you would do is you would start over and try and fit a, a different model, hoping that you get a residual plot that's, that's better behaved. Um, and and these, uh, these residual plots can, can come in all sorts of uh, shapes and sizes when, you, uh, when you're looking at, at trends in your data. So for example, here's a, another one um, that, that has a, a bit of a more subtle trend. Um, 
that uh, that is is still centered around zero, but looks like there's some pattern in our data. Um, in this case, uh, I, I don't actually know, but I guess that it's something like x times sine of x, um, or or maybe cosine of x, uh, depending on exactly where it starts. Um, that uh, that's suggesting um, even if uh, if we have a, a residual plot centered around zero, that that there's some more uh, there, there's some other underlying trend in this data, some pattern um, that, that we can capture and, and take advantage of to, to better be able to predict our data or, or to better model our data. So that's the, the frame that we're going to come into, uh, into, into this method with, uh, that, uh, that residuals are what's left over after you've taken out some trend of the data. And, and if there's, there's more patterns here, we want to we wanna figure out what those are. So uh, the, the residuals, just to, to put this down in words, are the, the values or patterns remaining after you fit a trend line, um, and, and they should not have any structure or pattern um, if you've, you fit your data well. Um, and, and that's uh, not, not necessarily all the case, uh, especially in, in some of these uh, machine learning models that we're going to build up iteratively, you know, the first time you try and fit data, uh, chances are uh, it, it, it may not fit that well. Um, and that's why we, we try and improve and improve our models with optimization. Um, and so a uh, question is, how do we uh, further reduce the residuals and better fit our data? Um, and, and kind of what approaches can we take besides the, the, the good old fashioned approach of scratch everything you've done so far and try and fit a, a more complicated or, or a different model? And the, the idea, uh, which, which uh, again, we, we've talked about uh, briefly before, or at least alluded to uh, in some of our discussions, is, is the idea of uh, modeling those residuals explicitly. Um, so if, uh, if you have uh, a pattern in your data that's, that's left over, you can just treat that as a raw original pattern and think about uh, what models you can build to, uh, to figure out the patterns in those residuals. And this is the, the approach that, that we're going to use um, for, for the, this section of the lecture, and it's called boosting. Um, so, so not to be confused with uh, many of the, the similar sounding words, uh, bagging and, and bootstrapping in particular that, that we used last time. Uh, boosting is, is different than, than bootstrapping, uh, where, where bootstrapping, we were pulling random subsets of, of data. Boosting is this idea of, uh, of fitting errors uh, iteratively or, or modeling residuals in our data. Uh, and this is a, a type of ensemble, um, just like we had uh, bagging as a type of ensemble last time, uh, where we looked at lots of different models that were all fit to different bootstrap samples of our data. Uh, this, uh, this boosting technique will also be fitting a, a whole bunch of different models. Um, and, and this uh, this takes a, a different philosophical approach, one more similar to the, to the ensembles we talked about last time, where we're trying to take a lot of simple models and put them together into something complex versus uh, starting with a, a single complex model, uh, which is, is the, the underlying assumption that, that comes into the, the prior uh, approach to residuals I just mentioned of uh, you know, throwing out what you have and, and fitting one really complex model. Um, to, to the data to try and get a, a good residual uh, or, or error distribution. So uh, it's th this uh, boosting approach is, is very similar to ensembles in a, a number of ways, uh, but, but it's different than the random forest uh, that we talked about last time as an ensemble approach uh, in that uh, the, the bootstrapped examples from a random forest were all totally independent. Uh, they all took in different data and tried to come to uh, a diverse set of solutions with, with diverse, uh, 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 paying attention to, to diverse features in, in our uh, data frames and, and information, um, and, and trying to create a complementary set of strategies to, to solve a problem, uh, where the approach that, that we're going to take um, by iteratively training on residuals is, uh, is less of a parallel approach and more of a serial approach where we're trying to take a, a single model and make it better and better rather than come up with lots of different complementary models. So to, to make this uh, slightly more explicit, uh, if we have some model, some function f of x, uh, we're going to fit uh, the, our first model, uh, f0 of x, uh, to our data. 
Um, and the residuals will be the errors that are left over, the difference between our actual outputs and our predicted outputs, uh, y minus f of x. Um, and, and that's the, the error term that, that we put on our residual plots. Um, we're then going to fit that residual with uh, another model. Um, so uh, f of 1 is the, the, the second version of our model, uh, the, the second model in our ensemble, you could say, um, that's trying to find out the pattern that's in the residual 0 or the residual of the, the, first, um, the first model. Um, then uh, taking this, uh, this one step further, we can say that our, our second model, um, the, the error of it will be uh, the, the error of uh, what we got, uh, the, the trend we got in our first, uh, the first model, and the trend that we got from our second model trying to fit that residual put together. Um, and, and that'll give us a, an even more fine-grained uh, model to, to fit the, the data. Um, and then we can uh, repeat this uh, again and again, adding more models. So uh, F2 will try and fit the residual that was left over from model one. Um, and, uh, and what we'll end up with is uh, the, the model F0 plus F1 plus F2. Um, and hopefully that'll do even a better job than, than either of the first two uh, alone or together. Um, with, with all three models, we'll, we'll have more expressivity um, and hopefully uh, fit better the, the trends and, and the errors that, that we did before. Um, so as you can see, we're, uh, we're just building up a, a model uh, of the, the data um, by trying to uh, iteratively get rid of all the errors that we have uh, in our, our previously fit models. Uh, so, so you can see how this is an ensemble of lots of different simple models that we put together, but you can also see how it's very different from the approach before where we took all of these models as independently processing the data and tried to, to reach some consensus between them, where in this case we're uh, processing the data once, uh, but with uh, a combination of models that, that are finer and finer grained to uh, different patterns um, or, or patterns at, at different resolutions or patterns with, with different types uh, as we uh, further refine um, the, the, the fit we have to our data and the, the overarching or, or cumulative trend line between all of these, these models. So this is the, the basic idea behind uh, boosting. Uh, the, the, the way that we uh, frame this, as I mentioned before, is, is on uh, regression problems um, because the uh, the, the residual plots, I think, make a lot of sense of a trend line left over that you're trying to fit. Uh, but this, this same idea applies to classification as well. Um, I'm not going to walk through the details because it gets a, a little bit trickier in that we're doing this on, on loss functions like our, our mean squared error or more likely our cross entropy loss. Um, and taking the, the gradients of that loss function, adding those, those up, uh, or, or trying to, to better fit the, the gradients uh, or, or of our errors. Um, and and that, uh, that follows the, the same basic framework, uh, but I, I think it's just a, a bit easier to, to intuit with the regression model. Um, so, so we're not going to dive too, too deep into that, but uh, just, just trust me that the, the basic ideas are, are very similar. So to, to show a picture of this, you, you know that I, I like to uh, be a, a visual learner uh, at times. Uh, if we have some original data set that, uh, let's say this is uh, trying to classify these data points into uh, pluses and minuses, uh, what we'll do is we'll fit some really simple model. Uh, in, in this case, it's just uh, 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 what, what, what's a, a simplified uh, um, decision tree that just has a, a, a single linear decision. Um, and we pick the, the best line of fit here. Turns out that we get a, a lot of these data points right, um, but we, we have some wrong. Um, and so when we think about what our residual is going to be in this classification problem, uh, it's, it's a little subtle to see, but the, the points that uh, we've misclassified have been enlarged in the, the picture just to show that, that these are uh, now uh, bigger errors or, or more uh, stronger, um, stronger uh, uh, losses in our, in our cross entropy loss, uh, in our, our, uh, our residual loss. Um, and so, so these are more important to fit in the, the next model that we try and look at. Um, 
And it turns out that the, the next best uh, decision line, the best next threshold that you can put in here is uh, across not the, the horizontal feature, but the, the vertical feature in this 2D plot. Um, and, and that uh, uh, nicely distinguishes two of the misclassified points, but we still have, have that one left that's now growing bigger and bigger. This is now you know, the, the most obvious trend in, in our data is this one point that's, that's left out. Um, and so the, the next decision threshold uh, uh, really nicely uh, encapsulates just that point um, and, and shows uh, some, uh, some, some trend uh, that, that that's a, a positive point. Um, and as you can see, we've kind of carved out the, the different parts of this problem um, to build uh, what, what ends up being a, an ensemble of uh, decision trees, uh, which really nicely captures the, the data. Um, and the, the way that we combine these, uh, which is a, a weighted combination of the, the individual classifiers that's, that's weighted, uh, again, by their gradients, uh, not a, a detail we need to go into a lot of depth on the, the math behind. Um, but they're, they're weighted in a way that uh, hopefully when you sum all these classifiers together, uh, they end up giving you uh, an answer uh, that's uh, uh, a hopefully much more accurate uh, binary classification than any of the, the individual models themselves would have. Um, so, so this is the, uh, pictorially the idea of, uh, of boosting in, in classification. Um, I, I noted here that we use decision trees that, that uh, just grabbed a threshold along some of the features. Um, you can think about uh, just like the ensemble method uh, behind random forests could use things besides decision trees and it would still be an ensemble, just not called random forests. Um, here we can we can use boosting with a, a lot of different underlying models too. Um, and, and they're they're typically still considered boosting uh, methods. Um, they, they won't have uh, specific names of, of the different flavors of, of boosting that we'll talk about in a, a second here. Um, but uh, but you can here this is fitting uh, linear uh, regression lines or actually logistic regression lines because it's classification. Um, the, these linear classifiers um, across uh, across these different learners um, and summing them together gives us uh, you know all of these different trend lines that, that we can think about as just distinguishing uh, the two classes in our data and the, the weighted sum of them. Uh, hopefully makes uh, some composite trend line that, that really captures some of the intricacies of our data set. And uh, as we think about adding more and more of these classifiers, as you can see, we, we get uh, more and more complex uh, 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 decision boundaries here. Um, that uh, that uh, we, we want to be careful aren't overfitting our uh, our training data, just as, as we wanted to make sure um, in, in our decision trees, we didn't go too deep um, be, because we're, we're stacking these decisions um, one after another in the same way that we did with the decision trees. We want to be careful that we're not using too many models um, and, and trying to fit the residual too many times with, with this boosting approach too. Um, but, but as you can see, it, it can become really expressive as you're uh, looking at uh, a lot of these trend lines. So uh, as, uh, as, as a whole, um, this idea of boosting is uh, a really effective um, and, and is thus a, a really popular approach uh, taken to, to fit models, um, uh, especially regression models, but, but classification models too. Um, and uh, uh, Actually, that, that's not true. It's, it, it's often uh, often used for classification as well. Um, that uh, that that this boosting idea, however, is is most frequently used with decision trees. Um, and so uh, so just like uh, random forests uh, were a way of increasing uh, the generalizability of of decision trees, um, this uh, th this approach takes a, a slightly different. Uh, a slightly different uh, emphasis, um, and instead of taking a, a bunch of decision trees that, that maybe were, were too complex and, and overfit to our training data, um, and, and uh, looking at consensus between a lot of diverse ones to try and get better generalization, the approach we take here is we take really short, small, uh, simple decision trees that by themselves uh, are, are very underfit to the data. Um, think about you know a decision tree with 
uh, maybe just one split or, or uh, which is the, the example that we saw in the picture, or, you know, maybe it, for, for some approaches, you know, two or three or four splits, uh, actually the, the, the most common one is just one, one decision boundary, one, uh, a depth of one per decision tree. Um, and, and we're taking these overly simple models and stacking them up, uh, up serially to, um, to refine the outputs of a model that you know is too simple, uh, which is to say, you know, we'll have trends in the residuals after you fit it. Um, and so, uh, yes, this is, uh, is taking a, a, the same uh, very high-level approach as, as random forest, but uh, solving the problem in a, in a very different way. Um, so, the, the, so this approach, uh, gradient boosting, um, and, and random forest are, are really nice complementary models um, that, that are both great to apply out of the box on a, a lot of problems that you have in your data sets. Um, and, and as a result, they're really popular uh, approaches um, and, and lots of flavors have come out that have specific tricks that make them work a, a little bit better. Um, so if you hear uh, things like uh, adaptive boosting or, or add a boost, uh, XG boost is a, a really popular one. Um, light GMB is a, a slightly newer one. Um, that, that these ideas uh, with gradient boosting um, are, are approaches that, that are all under this same kind of uh, meta category of, of boosting models. Um, and, and so if you, you see any of these, um, know that they're, uh, they're really uh, great and, and powerful models um, to, to use in your projects. Uh, as I mentioned, the the individual models, uh, the individual decision trees that we have are, are going to be very small and very simple, um, and that's that's on purpose philosophically. Um, that uh, that that this is a a, a a method of combining simple or weak models together in, in an ensemble, um, and uh, and so uh, you you can apply the, these ideas to very complex. Um, very complex models at each step within boosting. Um, for example, uh, we're, we're about to talk about a much more complex method in, in SVMs, and you could think about those being, uh, you know, put together in a, a boosted method, uh, but uh, the, the idea of, of overfitting um, would be much more prevalent there when you're, when you're combining a lot of really expressive models uh, compared to uh, the, the idea here where you're Combining a lot of really simple and naive models together. So uh, to to end uh, talking about uh, gradient boosting, as we often do, I'll point you towards the implementation of this that, that talks about um, some of the the uh, basic ideas and, and parameters that you might want to think about fitting. Um, the uh, the the gradient boosting classifier here is a, a broad one. Um, that, uh, that that talks about uh, boosting more generally uh, to to go to a specific flavor of the the boosting algorithm. The the add a boost is also uh, put into scikit-learn, um, and and as you can see here, the the first uh, argument of of base estimator implies that even with with add a boost, which is traditionally with a decision tree, you can you can add in uh, you know any model you want. Um, and, and in particular, you can see the the default here says that it's a decision tree of, of depth one, uh, just like we uh, we just talked about. So uh, so so boosting is is really great. Um, the some of the pros are uh, that it's uh, it's flexible for both classification or regression uh, outputs as well as uh, real valued or categorical inputs. Um, being based off of decision trees, um, it can handle the, the same type of data that, that those can, either with, uh, with the uh, splits uh, along the different uh, categories for um, qualitative data or, or with thresholds for quantitative data. Um, and uh, because we can continuously fit uh, errors, um, these models can be, can be really, really accurate uh, as as you get to to deeper and deeper trees, um, turning to the, the cons, one of the the big cons is that you you can very easily go too far and and overfit to your training data. Um, so you, you want to be careful about uh, about choosing the the correct number of trees, 
and uh, and and cross validation is a, a great way to to go about this um, using uh, your your held out validation set to to try and pick the the right depth uh, that, that you're looking at. I think is uh, the the number of estimators it's it's called in Scikit-Learn. Um, and and you want to you know be making sure that you pay attention to these hyperparameters because as I said if if you have for example uh, uh, a a uh, boosting tree that's that's too long, um, you'll you'll suffer a lot of the same issues in, in overfitting as we did just with single decision trees too, which is, is what we're trying to avoid here. Uh, the the one of the other cons is that uh, unlike random forests, um, that uh, that we're really good at ignoring some of the trends in the data. And when we looked at at the diverse set of classifiers that uh, that threw away some of the the features at each time or we're looking at just subsets of our data, um, both of those things uh, make, it, make it more robust and, and resilient to, uh, to uh, being overly sensitive to uh, specific features or data points. That's not the case here. And in fact, by continuously fitting residuals, um, we, we hone in more and more on whatever trends are available within our data sets. Um, and so, uh, so uh, we we have to be a, a little bit careful uh, or a little bit more careful with our, our pre-processing um, that that there's uh, you know uh, like like decision trees um, we we can handle any type of, of scaling um, or or normalization or ranges for our features but uh, but we should be uh, careful about um, about overfitting to to outliers and, and specific features. Um, in, in gradient boosted trees much more so than in rainforests. So uh, to, to move on, I know we're, we're flying quickly through this, but I want to cover both of these methods um, today. Uh, we, we have a, another approach that's, uh, again, uh, similar in many ways, but, but different in many ways um, from the gradient boosted trees that we just talked about. So the the idea here is again to start from uh, simple linear functions um, and to uh, to think about ways to to enhance um, how how those models fit and and what sorts of problems they're they're good at. Um, so uh, imagine uh, going back to a logistic regression problem and and think about uh, think about for example many different thresholds that would. Uh, would properly distinguish, or, or even think about the ones that improperly distinguish between two classes of data. Um, and, and as you can see here, uh, there are, are lots of potential ones, and all of the ones shown here have 100% uh, classification accuracy um, and, and perfect mean squared error, uh, perfect sensitivity, perfect specificity. Uh, every, everything about the metrics of all of these lines are, are perfect um, in, in terms of outcomes. But I, I think intuitively we can we can think about some of these being better or worse than others, um, and and uh, maybe in your head you you can already picture uh, what the ideal uh, decision boundary between these two classes would would really look like, um, and so uh, so so the question is what what is that boundary what what are the rules or, or what's the the intuition that we have uh, for thinking about what makes a good decision boundary between some points. Um, if we're trying to be as specific and, and as precise as, as possible uh, within this this gray area here, and not just to say um, you know, that, that we're relying on a metric like accuracy. So one of the the things that, that you may be picturing, even if you you didn't uh, kind of articulate it to yourself just now, is that uh, we want a hyperplane that that goes right down the middle of the gap between the two classes. Um, this is uh, assuming that, that there is a gap between the classes, um, and, and I, we won't go into the, the technical details here, but these approaches work even if, if there is some overlap and, and not a gap, um, that, uh, that the, the losses turn out to be worse, but the, the math can work out the same. Um, that uh, we, we think about splitting the difference between this, the, the gap between the, the two data points, and uh, again, if I pushed you harder to say what exactly do you mean by split the difference, um, you might say that uh, that what we want is to be as far away from the closest point um, to to that plane. So if you you think about drawing a, a perpendicular line 
from the, the green uh, optimal hyperplane uh, perpendicular out to the, the blue circle and also back to the, the red circles, all of those lines are, are the same distance, which is to say that uh, we're, we're equally as far from the blue point as we are from the, the red point, or, or we've cut this, this difference right down the middle. Um, and that, uh, that anything um, in, in between this, uh, this, the, the two dashed lines here is maybe our, uh, our uh, not so confident range um, that, uh, that we can think about maybe, you know, uh, a point right on the, the center line has a probability of 0.5 of being in either one. Um, uh, a point that's, you know, right on the, the blue line, we can say we're confident that's, that's going to be a, a blue with probability one. Uh, a point that's on the the bottom dashed line, we could say, you know, that has probability zero of being a, a blue 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 circle, um, and and as you can imagine, in between, like a, a a point that's that's close to the blue circle maybe has a probability of 0.9. Just think about a, a gradient flowing across this this margin. So uh, that that's really nice in that uh, we we have uh, you know some specific range, and so we can map out our uncertainty between the two points. Uh, but what's maybe more important here is that the the uh, area uh, behind the the two points um, is is uh, just clearly classified as uh, anything on uh, above the the top dash line is a, a blue circle and everything below the bottom dash line is a red square. Um, and so uh, so from this uh, we can think of, of many implications of drawing up uh, a decision boundary in the way that, that we just described um, and, and the first and, and most major point to get across here is that uh, unlike all the models we've talked about so far that look at mean squared error across all of the data points you could you that you have in your data set um, the, the method that we just described only cares about the points that are closest to our decision boundary um, and, it, and it uses, in this case, just three of the, the data points in our data set to, to build this, this boundary line. Um, and so, so that in itself is, is really novel and, and is a way that, that this uh, is, is different from some of the, the other approaches. Um, and, and in particular, these data points that, that we use to um, to, to push against the, the decision boundary and, and keep it in the middle to, to support it, you might say, um, uh, th these uh, data points we call support vectors. Um, and so, so they're the thing that, that tell our, our decision boundary where, where to be. Um, they're the, the closest points uh, along the, the edge between where our data set is, is changing classes in, in this, uh, this 2D space here. And then uh, the model that, uh, that uses these two points to try and draw our optimal decision boundary um, that, that relies on these, uh, these, in this case, three support vectors, uh, we, we call this approach uh, in this model a support vector machine. Uh, so that's where uh, what, what SVM in the, the title stood for, uh, uh, support vector machine. This is the, the type of model that we're going to be talking about for the remainder of today's lecture. Um, and uh, again, we're not going to talk about the, the training too much. Um, I'll just say again that we use iterative optimization. So we start with a, a, a dividing line that's pretty bad, um, that, that doesn't optimally push these apart, or doesn't optimally cut, the, cut these in, in half. And, uh, and we take our support uh, vectors and they push and push and push against the decision boundary until they're both you know, pushing equally and it's, it's an equilibrium, which is to say it's you know, halfway between both of them. There are our support vectors um, are, are what make this uh, linear separating line. Um, and and uh, what we have here is just a 2D example where a line uh, segregates these, uh, these two points, but you can think about this in any dimensional space. Um, and so for example, in three dimensional space with, with three features in your data set, then you have a separating plane. Or in four dimensions, you have a, a, se a separating hyperplane, and I, I, I forget what the, the name of the planes are as we go up in, in higher dimensions. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, it's a, 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 a plane one less dimension than the number of features you have in, in your data set. Um, and the, the uh, number of points that you need to support that plane um, depends on the, the number of features that you have. Uh, but in general, will be much smaller than the, the whole data set that you can imagine. 
Um, and unless you're, you're really sparse in a high dimensional space, um, chances are you have some points that are away from this decision boundary. Um, and, and those points uh, really don't get, uh, don't get taken into account. Um, and, and because of that, this model, even, uh, even though we're just drawing a linear line here, um, is, is actually uh, already kind of a nonlinear model um, in that it's, uh, it's not uh, looking um, at, at your, your entire data set and, and treating all of those points equally with something like a mean squared error. Um, and so uh, what, what this means practically is that we can move around the, the points, uh, anything outside of our decision boundary. And, and since we're not really paying attention to them, it, it won't affect our, uh, what, what our model comes up with at all. Um, and so that's, that's a, an interesting feature of these support vector machines um, and, and something we'll, we'll come back to uh, in, in a minute. Um, but uh, it's uh, so. So this is to say that uh, that we're we're not linear with respect to all of our data, but uh, in, in this case we are uh, linearly modeling uh, just the the three support vectors we we have here. The this uh, this idea of drawing a, a straight line between our classes, of course, is, is the the other version of of linear linearity that we have here, and and you can imagine that that's something that's also pretty simple to relax. Um, we can think of, um, of, of you know, drawing any curve intuitively between these points. Um, and, and as you can see here, that's, uh, that's kind of what, what we have depicted um, in, in what's separating the, the red and the blue classes in this, this cartoon here, um, because obviously a, a straight line won't be able to, to separate these two well. Um, but it, it turns out that, that what we do um, uh, again, not not to get uh, too much in the into the technical details, um, but what we do is we try and uh, find a a linear separator that can separate these points, um, so that that we can keep our model simple um, and and take this same idea of just pushing our line or our plane forward or back between our two classes and not have to worry about changing its shape as we go, which which is a much more complicated thing to to think about mathematically. Um, and so the, the way that we do this is a, a, a really nice thing um, that, that we call uh, the, the kernel trick, um, which is essentially uh, feature engineering that's going on within the, the support vector machine. Uh, so what, uh, what SVMs very commonly do um, is that, uh, that they'll add in new dimensions into our search space, new features uh, in, in our data set, uh, so, so to speak. Um, they, they won't literally be added to our, our data frame in, in pandas, but they'll they'll be used as we're trying to fit our model. Um, in that they'll, they'll be uh, you know uh, terms other than than just the the plain features that you you add in. Um, so we, we saw something along this flavor when we were talking first about multiple linear regression, where where we said that uh, you know polynomial regression where you feed in. Uh, x and then also you know x plus x squared uh, plus x cubed plus x to the fourth um, as as different terms in our linear regression model or, or our multiple linear regression model um, that that is a, is a, a, a an approach to you know kind of building your own features and and that's the the same thing that, that happens here is we take transformations of the data that we already have. Um, and that could be, you know, squaring or cubing the the features. It, it could be a handful of other things that, that lead us to uh, building these other dimensions. Uh, and as we build more of these dimensions, um, hopefully they're uh, they're mapped in a way in which they they pull our two classes apart as we as we build uh, the 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 extra um, the extra bypass dimensions here. And you can see that the, the, the blue points are being pulled up and the red points are being pulled down. And so as it turns out, we can still put in a separating plane that, that goes through them um, and, and, uh, and linearly uh, classifies the, the points that we have here. Um, so th this is just to say that this, uh, this idea of, uh, of adding in more uh, uh, engineered features or, or kernels um, is uh, is just to to make it easier for us to draw the decision boundaries uh, with, uh, with 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 uh, linear lines and planes. 
And uh, an example of uh, maybe another function besides just uh, you know uh, uh, quadratic or or cubic or or you know other uh, other functions that, that we've talked about so far, you might think of as for example a radial basis function. So that's just to say, you know there there's some point in our uh, in our in this case two D space of our feature combinations. And we can write that as, let's say, uh, feature one squared plus feature two squared. Um, and if, if you remember from, uh, from geometry way back when, um, that's uh, the, the formula for uh, a circle. And by you know, centering that at different points in, your, uh, in, in your, your 2D frame here, you can actually build these little peaks or hills um, within, uh, within your, uh, your, your variables. Um, and, and you can imagine, you know, the same thing with with uh, so this, this is a, a quadratic function here, um, as, as I mentioned, with with the two features being squared. You can think of, you know, cubic ones too, um, and, and think about, you know, the the uh, more saddle-like patterns that, that would happen there. Um, but but either way, uh, that, that they're pulling uh, the the different classes uh, up or down by different amounts. Um, and, and let us, you know, hopefully draw these these really nice uh, separating lines. Um, it, it turns out that uh, what, what we have here uh, with our our quadratic or our radial basis function um, is is really nice for separating these types of, of instances where you have a, a chunk or a, a cluster of points within another point, and that's. Uh, actually, a, a fairly common thing that, that we think about when we're uh, looking at, at classifying things in 2D space. Um, and, and you can think of, of also combinations of these that, that you might have, you know, a, a few of these peaks put together to make some really strange looking uh, uh, non-convex uh, shape that, that we also could draw some separating line through or separating plane through and get a, a really complex uh, a 2D line um, when, when we project that back into our, our flat space. Uh, and, and that looks looks like this. So uh, the the linear function on the left it, it obviously has no transformation. Um, like I said, the the quadratic functions make these nice curves. Uh, the the cubic functions uh, make uh, more more S shaped curves. Uh, the the radial basis functions are really nice for for pulling out specific instances. Uh, a, a sigmoid function uh, might might be a good one. Um, for for looking at uh, at um, certain certain areas and, and you can think of a, a Gaussian or, a, or an absolute value kind of doing the same thing, um, making some valley or, or trough um, within our search space, um, and and so uh, depending on on which of these uh, we end up with, uh, we can uh, express now really complex uh, patterns that break up our our classification data here. Um, with uh, with a, again a, a pretty simple approach of just using support vectors to to push a um, a plane in this three uh, D space to to the right spot between the two classes. So uh, this uh, uh, approach again is uh, is available in your Scikit-Learn packages. Um, the uh, support vector machines come in a couple flavors. What we've talked about so far is the support vector classification. Um, but there, there's also a package for support vector regression, um, which uh, again we, we won't dive into uh, for the, the the sake of slightly more complicated math. Um, but uh, it follows the the same basic idea. Uh, the the trick here is that instead of uh, pushing points farther and farther away from the decision boundary, now we're looking at trying to build a decision boundary that has points as close as you can to it. Um, which uh, you know m makes sense for for thinking about what regression lines do, or, or try and, and draw curves that, uh, that that fit the the data nicely. Um, so uh, so just a, a heads up and, and no more detail that, that we can be using this for both classification and, and regression. Um, and, uh, and and when would we actually want to use these? Uh, so the the support vector machine takes a, a very different approach, like we've said, from some of the models we've looked at so far. Um, and, and in particular, the, the unique thing is that we pay attention and, and use only a few support vectors in our data set for building this model. Um, and, and because we use fairly few of them, uh, that means that, that we can work uh, really well uh, on small data sets. 
uh, the, the most of the models we've talked about so far do better the, the more data that you have. And, and that is true of SVMs too, um, but they're, they're surprisingly efficient with, with smaller data set, um, uh, especially when you have uh, uh, not very complex basis functions. Uh, with with the, these kernel tricks, um, you, can, uh, you can represent really complex functions, but, uh, but especially when the decision boundaries are, are fairly simple, um, and, and especially when they're fairly clean, uh, SEMs will just work beautifully. Um, and, and that's true even when you have really high dimensional data, which is to say when you have many, many different features, um, oftentimes uh, the, the relationship between the number of features that you have or the number of columns and the number of data points or the number of rows in your data frame um, is, is one that, uh, that people often get behind the eight ball on, um, especially when you're looking at, at complex classification tasks with, uh, let's say, high dimensional structured data. Um, that uh, that for uh, many columns to make the the math work out for let's say fitting a linear regression line, uh, you need uh, hopefully many times more, uh, but but at least as many uh, data points as you have features. And with with SVMs that are just pushing this this plane around in whatever dimensional space, um, it, it turns out that that's not quite so harsh a restriction. Um, and and we we can fit models that that often work surprisingly well, even if we have fewer data points than we have features, uh, which is, is uh, a, a pretty surprising thing uh, uh, statistically, actually. Um, some of the, the cons are that, uh, that, that this uh, approach um, doesn't uh, use all of your data points. So if, if you have a, a nice large data set, um, you may be able to find uh, better trends if, if you are using all of your data. Um, and uh, and uh, that, uh, that 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 SVMs might not be the the right approach to do that. Uh, the basis functions or, or the kernels that we use are pretty critical to getting uh, the SVMs to work well. And it's there, there's besides looking at at two D instances like we saw here and, and picking out ones that make sense, uh, which is something that, that you can do in two D, but but really doesn't scale well. Um, that uh, that it's it's really hard to figure out what basis functions actually are good or not for your model. Um, in uh, in scikit-learn and and more generally, uh, there's only a handful that are actually used um, because uh, you can think of uh, of them as as being really really general. Uh, the the you know, radial basis function especially, but but many of these. Um, uh, Many of these uh, uh, kernels can can lead to a whole host of really complex separating lines, um, and so uh, so usually just trying out a few of them, um, and and with the limited number in scikit-learn, you can even try out all of them. Um, you'll you'll kind of brute force your way into figuring out what the the best uh, kernel is for the the data that you have. Um, and then uh, one, one other thing is that uh, by just paying attention to a small handful of data points, we're uh, more robust to the noise on the outliers uh, that, that are far away from our decision boundary, but, uh, but the, the noise along the points on our decision boundary, so especially when you have really fuzzy overlapping classes, um, the uh, the the SVM you know really hones in on on a small handful of data points there and, th and that makes it uh, it uh, somewhat susceptible to the noisy uh, noisy data points in that regime and um, and especially these these fuzzy boundaries um, so uh, it's it's true that that every model works better the the cleaner of a separation you have in your data. Uh, but that's uh, especially true of, of SVMs that really put a lot of their, their weight in how they build the model right on that separating line. Uh, so uh, to, to wrap things up here, um, we've, uh, we've talked about uh, a couple other tools that you guys might want to consider for uh, building more and more complex models uh, in your, your projects. Uh, another ensemble method in boosting uh, that, that takes a, a different approach from random forests and, and builds up models by trying to refine and, and, uh, and detect trends and patterns in your residuals or your errors. Um, a, a really great approach um, 
the SVMs are, are also uh, fantastic in, in their niche, which is uh, especially um, smaller data sets. Um, though, though those tend to be quite common and, and uh, you know, small um, actually uh, is, is representative of, of quite a bit of, of data science. I'll, very rarely do we have, you know, enough or too much data in, in practice. So, so SVMs are, are used really widely. Um, and, and both of these approaches um, are, are great to, to use out of the box. Uh, gradient boosting approaches uh, especially, um, I, I feel like, are, are often what you see as the, the winner of some uh, modeling competition on, on Kaggle or, uh, or something that you know, someone has used in their, in their data science project and found to be the most effective thing. Um, so if, if you're doing uh, some, uh, some uh, modeling heavy uh, projects, I'd uh, encourage you as you're looking at uh, comparing a whole bunch of models to uh, especially put gradient boosting uh, models, but, but also SVMs into that repertoire. Um, and, and as we've uh, show, shown in class, uh, you know, adding in uh, some more models and trying them out in scikit-learn is, is really easy to do with just swapping out the, the model names. Um, so it's, it's something I'd, I'd highly recommend for, for all of your projects. Um, we're, uh, we're getting a, a little bit long here, um, and uh, I, I know both of these uh, topics are, uh, are a little complex, and we, we flew through both of them. Um, but uh, for, for the sake of time, uh, let's, let's call things here um, and, and happy to, to take questions and, and uh, comments on these uh, in the, the live lecture too. Uh, so take care till then and I'll, uh, I'll see you online.